Hi, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Kelly Pirtle with NOAA Communications in Norman, Oklahoma, and I'm a member of NOAA's Central Region Collaboration Team. And I will be your host for today's webinar. Today's three-minute thesis webinar has been organized by the NOAA Central Region Collaboration Team as a way to increase knowledge and awareness of projects and research in specific areas. In this case, the value of social science research in weather forecasting. This model is a format used by universities across the country as a way to briefly share information about a project, initiative, or research. This is our third time to do it, and we have learned so much from each webinar. As you can see on the agenda, each presenter you will hear from today will have three minutes and one slide to cover their topic. From the list on the screen, we have a variety of topics and presenters across, from across the country. And we'll hear about several social science research projects, the growing tornado risk in the southeastern United States, as well as helpful tips for communicating weather information. We've got this uh, organized with two sections with three speakers each and one section with two speakers. After each section, we will take a break for questions from you, our audience, uh, that will be directed to each group of presenters. And we will have a few minutes at the end for all the panelists to respond to your questions. So that means that at any point during the presentations, please submit your questions in writing using the questions pane of the GoToWebinar. Bethany Perry, the coordinator for the NOAA Central Region Collaboration Team, will collect them for our Q&A sessions throughout the webinar. We are recording today's webinar and it will be available for viewing by anyone who was unable to attend today. We plan to have it posted on Monday on the NOAA Central Region Collaboration Team website. That is www.regions.noaa gov slash central. Our previous three minute thesis webinars on severe weather and citizen science are linked there as well. And you know, we'd love to get your feedback. Please take a moment at the conclusion of today's webinar to complete a very brief survey. Uh, to make things go, help things go smoothly during today's presentation, everyone except the presenters will be in listen only mode. If you experience technical problems, please use the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. With that, I think we're ready to begin. Um, we're pleased to kick off our webinar with Susan Jocelyn. She is an associate professor in the University of Washington Psychology Department. Her research focuses on decision-making and communicating uncertainty information, such as weather forecasts. And she will share an example of that research with us today. Susan, unmute and take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. I always like to begin by um, describing my perspective because it's a little bit different than most people working on weather issues from a social science perspective. I'm a cognitive psychologist, so I'm interested in individual cognition and I'm an experimental psychologist. Um, and what I've been studying for the last 20 years is how best to communicate uncertainty or risk to non-experts or members of the public. And I do this by running experiments in which participants are all assigned the same task. And what I'm illustrating here on this slide is a task in which participants are asked to decide whether or not to salt the roads based on a nighttime low temperature forecast to prevent icy conditions the following morning. And then I take this larger group and I break them down into subgroups. So what I'm illustrating here is a group, one group, half of the subjects, who got expected nighttime low temperatures, 35 degrees, and I refer to this as a deterministic forecast. And the other group get, also gets the probability of freezing. And what we find when we do this is that people who have numeric probabilities, like a 20% chance of below freezing temperatures, trust the forecast more and make better decisions. 
And the graph on the lower right hand corner of the slide shows you how they make better decisions. So on the y-axis is the proportion of people choosing to salt the roads, and on the x-axis is the probability of, of freezing. Um, the blue line shows the participants who had the probability of freezing, and the black line is the participants who did not. And the thing to notice is that when uh, participants have this information, numeric uncertainty, uncertainty information, that they take precautionary action less often when the probability is unlikely and more often when the probability is likely. And so um, uh, this is just one example, but we have many different tasks now where we've shown the same thing, high wind warnings, calling a snow day, and many different agricultural scenarios. We've also used many different um, numeric expressions, threshold probabilities, predictive intervals, and odds ratios. And we always find the same thing, that people are better able to differentiate situations in which precautionary action is required when they have numeric uncertainty information. There is one caveat, though. Um, this information has to be expressed in a way that matches the decision that they're making, that doesn't require any further calculations on their part. Uh, what doesn't seem to matter, and this is somewhat of a surprise, is education. So this is true of people with just a high school education and those with a college degree. And that's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Our next presenter is Jeanette Sutton, an associate professor in the Department of Communication and the director of the Risk and Disaster Communication Center, both at the University of Kentucky. She specializes in disaster and risk, with a primary focus on online informal communications, as well as public alerts and warnings disseminated via terse messaging channels. She has some practical tips for amplifying your tweets. Jeanette? Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me to join you today. So as you heard, my area of research is risk communication on social media and short messaging devices, such as wireless emergency alerts. And you can find the papers and talks by my colleagues and me on the website at the bottom of the slide under my picture. So I'm gonna talk about message amplification. And amplification is getting your message to be viewed by more people who need to see it. So we can call it diffusion or retransmission, but it's, it's about message passing. And in social media, amplification is making your message go farther beyond your local network of followers. So to think about amplification on Twitter, you need to understand that Twitter is a technology that functions in two ways. Through loosely constrained networks of followers, so people who are already connected to you, and as a broadcast mechanism where people have to find you. The goal of a risk communicator needs to be to reach both types of users, the followers and what we'll call the finders. So how do we do that? First, consider the purpose of the message and provide value to each group. So followers are people who are already part of your network. Their role is they can help you to amplify your message to their followers. And these are people you can engage by sharing relevant information. This includes information about weather and actions your followers can take to be prepared. So for example, the message from NWS Nashville is an example of a tweet that engages users by giving them something of value. It provides information and it also has a call to action. It's asking people to sign up. And right now it's also educating users about the work of the National Weather Service. So it's growing credibility of the office and it gives them something to do while they're stuck at home during this stay at home time. So most NWS accounts do not have a large number of followers who are already engaged with users, but you still want to reach them, especially during threat conditions. So we're gonna call those finders um, and you need to help them to find you and notice you. So this brings me to my second point. You need to drive attention. By using hashtags, your tweets will be put into a channel of communication about the event or the threat that you are posting about. And there's also ways to increase the visibility, such as using all caps or attaching an image. And both of these techniques help your most important messages to catch the visual attention of Twitter users. This brings me to my third point. 
Once you have the attention of finders and followers, provide content that's relevant. In this recent tornado warning message for Jonesboro, Arkansas, you see that it includes information about the hazard, its impact, who's susceptible and where, and it tells people what to do. It says, this is a life-threatening situation, seek shelter now. By including these two types of content in your message, you increase the likelihood that it will be retransmitted. So there's three steps to amplify your message, provide value, drive attention, and be relevant. And you need to do this, whether it's during good weather or bad. And that's all I have for right now. Thank you, Jeanette. Very useful. Next up, we have Castle Williams, a PhD candidate at the University of Georgia, who has graciously agreed to condense his entire dissertation into three minutes. We know he's up to the challenge as, she sh as he shares with us why message consistency is so important. Castle? Thanks, Kelly. Um, so with the rise of the internet and social media, operational meteorologists have become increasingly concerned that inconsistencies among weather messages may negatively affect their many audiences. In particular, meteorologists often vocalize their concerns when weather graphics, like the convective outlook, use different visual designs to communicate the same forecast information. The challenge, however, is that our community has never empirically studied the implications of inconsistent graphical information and thus cannot adequately provide guidance or best practices for achieving a more consistent message in the weather enterprise. But that's where our project comes into play. Funded by NOAA's Joint Technology Transfer Initiative, our research project seeks to address this operational gap by using the Storm Prediction Center's convective outlook graphic as a vehicle to explore the effects of visual inconsistencies on end users. The first phase of our project was designed with two goals in mind. The first goal was to determine how members of the public interpret, use, and understand the SPC's public severe weather outlook product, which is the public facing version of the convective outlook graphic. This allowed us to provide the SPC with usability information and recommendations on how to improve the public severe weather outlook product. More importantly, however, this project was designed to use the convective outlook graphic to determine how members of the public evaluate the consistency between two graphics. According to participants, when two graphics depict a location in the same risk area and or color zone, they inevitably communicate the same message. Naturally, these criteria similarly emerged when participants described why two graphics did not convey the same message. However, participants also mentioned other specific ways in which two convective outlook graphics may differ or communicate a different message, and that being using different risk language, uh, zooming in and zooming out, or using a different number of risk categories. So to explore these findings further, the second phase of the project experimentally manipulated convective outlook graphics and asked end users to provide their perceptions of them. Our first experiment investigated five graphical inconsistencies to determine which ones result in the lowest perceived, lowest perceived consistency. You can see the different, one, the different convective outlook graphics that we created for this experiment on the slide. Um, additionally, each manipulated graphic was paired with an identical reference graphic, which is in the top left corner. This allowed us for, uh, to directly compare the perceived consistency across the five experimental conditions. Uh, click, please. A statistical analysis revealed that when two graphics change a location's risk area or use a different color scheme, it results in a significantly lower perceived consistency as compared to the other experimental conditions. We've also conducted two other experiments to more ex explicitly explore these effects. It's our hope that the results from this project will be able to offer preliminary recommendations to operational forecasters on how to improve message consistency when sharing convective outlook graphics with end users. Thanks. Thank you, Castle. All right, now we will take a few minutes to address some of the questions you have submitted. Again, reminder, you can type your questions in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Bethany, do you have some questions? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, the first question I have came in for Susan. Um, and the, the person asked that they've heard that people don't really understand probability and wondered if that is true. Well, um, yes and no. So um, I, if you'll remember, I didn't say I thought that people would completely understand probability. 
Um, and in fact, I don't think that they do, at least on a theoretical level. But what we found is that they don't have to completely understand it on a theoretical level in order to make a good use of it in terms of decision making. So what we say is that people have a practical understanding of probability rather than a theoretical understanding. Thanks, Susan. Uh, the next question is for Jeanette. Um, what's the most important thing that a risk communicator can do to amplify their message? The number one thing is to grow your follower numbers. And this is because the more followers that you have, the more partners you have who can amplify the message that you're trying to get out. And the number of followers um, is always the greatest thing that affects the models that we develop on retransmitting messages. It goes much beyond the content of the information or the ways that messages are written. It's who sees it, and that increases the likelihood the message will go farther. Thanks, Jeanette. Uh, Castle, the next one's for you. Um, what was one interesting thing that you noticed when you sat down with the members of the public and asked them about the convective outlook graphic? Uh, it was uh, interesting to, to talk to them about it in the first place, but I think in particular the thing that stood out is um, they were always interested in the motion of the graphic when, we, when most of us know that it's a, a static graphic. So when they were trying to, to determine their severe weather risk, they always looked downstream in order to determine what was coming up. So if their location was in a moderate risk, they would look like to the bottom left if they knew that's the way the weather moved. So they would kind of anticipate that an enhanced region was moving into the, their area versus just thinking about it statically. Thanks, Castle. Uh, and thank you guys all for the questions coming in. There's there's a lot, and so we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Um, uh, Jeanette, there's a good one for you. Um, are there is there um, such a thing as too many images in a tweet? This person says that they've heard more than two or three can negatively impact the message. That's a really interesting question. I have not done research on that, but um, the one thing that I think might be relevant to the question is the consistency of the information that's shared across those images on a single tweet. For example, we looked at the use of risk colored risk ladders and how they are associated with image the colors on a map. And people use those risk ladders like a legend to interpret the colors on the map. So, um, and not always correctly because risk ladders and the colors on the map aren't necessarily related to one another. And so if imagery is being used on a tweet to draw people's attention, it would be really important that the imagery actually explains one another in order to provide information that people can interpret themselves. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, Susan, there uh, is a question about uh, whether you could provide an example uh, for an application for agriculture. Uh, well, some of the tasks that we've used for agriculture are uh, also um, temperature tasks. So temperatures falling below uh, 32 degrees or below 20 degrees, um, where the um, participant's threshold is either of those two values. And again, we find that if we give them probabilistic information, the probability of temperatures less than 32 or 20 degrees, that they make better decisions in the sense that they are better able to differentiate situations which do and don't require precautionary action. Thanks, Susan. Uh, Castle, this next question's for you. Um, the, the person would like to know um, if people were still confused um, by using the same color and different words, and if they were confused when the Zoom changed. Uh, and the follow-up is, if you've done a presentation on any of this, can it be referenced? Um, I might ask you to restate the question, sorry. No problem, I'm doing my best. <laughs> no, you're um, fine. <laughs> uh, the, the person said people were still confused if it was the same color and different words. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't use the word confused. Um, I would just say that they pointed out that it was conveying a different message to them. Okay. And that was the same for if the Zoom changed as well? 
Correct. Yes. But I will I will follow up with that and say in the that was with a qualitative study. So we interviewed 25 people where we identified those different types of inconsistencies. But when we performed a experiment with a larger sample size, which is kind of that second phase that I was talking about, we used um, 600 uh, undergrad students and they identified color and changes in risk area as the most uh, prominent uh, factors in reducing their perceived consistency. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Um, and we've got time for one more. So Jeanette, uh, we've had a couple of questions kind of along this line, um, that if it's critical for forecast offices to uh, have a high number of, of followers, um, is do you have any recommendations on how the offices can go about doing that? So the, the best advice that I can give is um, approaching this kind of like um, selling Coca-Cola, which is something that my my colleague uh, Dennis Maletti would say, which is becoming so familiar to a, a a user group that they they think of your office when they think of weather, and so putting really useful information out there on a on a a daily basis or more than daily basis, and helping to um, make it valuable to your existing users, asking your existing users to retweet it to try and grow your follower numbers, um, working with other organizations to retweet each other so that you might drive people to your account would also be another way. Um, it comes down to advertising in a lot of in a lot of ways um, of trying to get people to to know about your channel and. Um, and then they can make the decision to follow you based upon the value that they see you providing. Well, thanks so much. And thanks to the audience for all of the great questions. And again, we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. Uh, Kelly, back to you. All right, thank you, Bethany. We will now transition to our next group, starting with the team of Cody Berry and Holly Obermeyer. Cody is the FACETS Program Lead at the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory in Norman. And Holly is an associate scientist in Boulder at the University of Colorado Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences, also known as CERES. They will tell us about KPHI TV and their research with TV weather broadcasters that takes place in the NOAA hazardous weather test bed. Cody and Holly. Thank you, Kelly. So our broadcast experiment started in 2016 as part of the probabilistic hazard information prototype experiment in NOAA's hazardous weather test bed. And we brought in one broadcast meteorologist e each week to test the usability of storm-based probabilities for severe weather in a mock television studio. We had National Weather Service forecasters in the hazardous weather test bed creating probabilistic hazard information for tornado, severe wind and hail, and lightning. The broadcasters then received that probabilistic hazard information or fee in real time and made coverage decisions, including when to crawl messages, post to social media, do short cut-ins, wall-to-wall coverage, weather casts, and stream live on a station website or a sister station. And because we're located west of the Mississippi River, our very first participant coined our fictitious, fictitious news station, KPTV. Thanks, Cody. So over the past four years, uh, we've really evolved as an experiment. We started out with two wall-mounted television screens and a webcam, um, but we've been able to now build that into a fully functioning studio. We have a green screen, um, lapel microphones, um, we have lights and a real camera now. And then we're also able to have two participants each week of the experiment. And this is great because it really allows us to recreate a real world kind of experience in that we are able to do um, team coverage of severe weather. And we're also able to have them switch between kind of taking the lead on the green screen and working the social media desk. So they alternate those. Um, these expanded capabilities have really allowed us to research how broadcast meteorologists may end up communicating storm-based probabilistic um, information, uh, both in an on-air and an online format, and we're also able to look at how they would potentially communicate that both graphically and verbally. So some of the research goals that we've targeted with this experiment over the last couple of years have really been centered around exploring if and how probabilistic information should relate to our current severe 
and severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings. And we're also developing best practices for how broadcasters and also broadcast vendors can display and communicate probabilistic information um, most effectively if this does become operational within the National Weather Service. Um, Cody and I are really passionate about this work because we know that broadcast meteorologists are still the cu crucial communicators of tornado warnings, and a recent studies still show that television is the primary source of warning information for the public. So we know that broadcasters do play a very critical role. They're able to um, give folks easy access to weather information that's explained in a clear and actionable manner. So with that, um, we feel that broadcasters are pretty imperative in the test phases of new warning products and that this is definitely um, in line with NOAA's mission to protect lives and property. Thank you, Cody and Holly. Um, I'd like to add that the NOAA Hazardous Weather Testbed in Norman has an official NOAA Twitter account. You can follow at NOAA underscore HWT. Next up, we have Justin Sharp, who is a research scientist with the University of Oklahoma's Cooperative Institute for Mesoscale Meteorological Studies, uh, also known as SIMS. Uh, however, he's usually in Norman today. He is joining us from London, where he is currently teleworking. He will talk about his Vortex Southeast research. Justin? Hi, good afternoon to everyone there. It's a good evening here. Um, so uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to get straight into it. So um, what I want to talk about that there is a broad consensus there, chances of surviving tornado, although there are certain parameters that are out of an individual's control, such as the magnitude of the event, as well as certain socioeconomic variables that mean that there's sometimes a value action gap between their intentions of what they might do to prepare themselves and respond and their actual actions. So what I'm going to do is go through four main points of my current research. First things first is complexity. There's no one simple solution. Um, this is evidence in the work that I've been carrying out on tornado uh, epidemiology, which are basically studies carried out on the causes of fatalities as well as their contexts. So I've been using an approach called meta-ethnography to identify patterns and anomalies and connections between themes that have come to the surface from looking at about, about 60 to 65 pieces of uh, research that have been written in this field. And I've chosen a certain type of um, a different form of meta-analysis because that mainly deals with quantitative studies. And actually, I was a mixture of quantitative and qualitative. So next is really how to survive. Um, the research has been useful for understanding what happened and also for learning lessons as, and as well as spotting gaps. For instance, um, if you look at figure two, which is the main image, which I know looks very, very messy. So right in the center of that, in the nexus there, is of these identified vulnerabilities, you've got mobile homes. But you've got all these threads going into and out of that. So it's not just about one particular vector of vulnerability here that's about many different ones and this shows that how much complexity there is. Um, I've defined a vector of vulnerability as resulting from um, a specific vector that can either improve or worsen the impact for individuals in the path of a tornado. Examples might include locations in a house when a tornado strikes, what building, floor if they were near a window, what warnings were given, received or whether they were inadequate or not, mobile homes, access to a basement and access to shelter. But as the diagram shows, there are actually many more missing from this. Well, one major finding that we, we found so far is that we do count fatalities, but we often ignore survivors. And this is a problem because we don't have a baseline of exposure. A really good example of this is uh, the Joplin, Missouri tornado 2011, which left 162 people dead. Based on the census, 13,547 people, or about 27% of the population, were in the tornado's path. That gives us an exposure rate and a fatality rate. If we divide those together, we'll see that the fatality rate came out about 1.2%, leaving 98.8% of people living. This is something that we need to be finding more about and recording. So conclusions. Um, the meta-ethnographic study that I've been doing so far has highlighted these vectors that increase vulnerabilities and the likely fatality rates. In turn, this is helping us to understand what we need to focus on with our new research priorities to increase survivability and reduce these fatalities. And while this update, we're also considering how we not only collect the data, but how we might involve our most at-risk communities 
through new methodologies that are more participatory and allowing it to have a closed loop feedback. In social science terms, such methodologies might include grounded theory, action research, and co-production of knowledge and learning. By placing these at the heart of our research focus, it allows for community participation in identifying and closing these value action gaps that I talked about at the beginning between intentions and behaviours in preparing for and responding to tornado threats. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Our third presenter in this section is Kim Clocko mclean Kim is a research scientist also with SIMS in Norman and is the team lead for the Behavioral Insights Unit at, affiliated with SIMS and the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. Before she begins, I would like to take a moment to thank Kim for providing ideas and guidance as we plan this webinar. We couldn't have done this without her. Kim will tell us more about how she and her associates are bridging social science research and operational practice. Kim? Thank you, Kelly. Um, it was a delight to help you guys. So thus far, we've heard a lot of talks on social science findings, especially revolving around how people respond to situations with risk and uncertainty, and how we can communicate that information more effectively. This talk will focus on, outside of great webinars like this, of course, how can we get that knowledge to operations? And likewise, how can we get the thoughts of those on the front lines, our forecasters, emergency managers, and broadcast meteorologists, back to researchers? What questions are they asking about human behavior? This isn't then just about research to operations, but also about building linkages of operations to research. This doesn't just happen by magic. As noted in a recent National Academy study on improving the uptake of social science research in the weather enterprise, it happens when you have organizations that exist to support transition. That's what I'll talk about today. We've established the Behavioral Insights Unit, a first of its kind organization within the research units of NOAA to improve the way social science research is done and to bring that knowledge closer to operations. Here are three examples of how we're doing this. Two will sound a little familiar. First is in NOAA's hazardous weather test bed. We bring together user groups and forecasters on the front end of risk communication technology development. In this way, we assure that innovations are useful, usable, and used. Um, what Cody and Holly talked about is one example of one user group. Um, we also have emergency manager experiments and again, treat forecasters as experimental participants. Risk communication to the public importantly involves transmission through these user groups. This process of creation is called co-production and differs from the normal track of technology development, i.e. the funnel, where technology can often get many steps out of the station before any end user ever sees it. Two, as part of the Vortex Southeast program, which is managed at NSSL, we're working with partners in the Southeast, part of what we've brought Justin on to do, as he described, to bring research findings about Southeast communities back to them. Justin will tell you that place-based research can easily be what he calls extractive. We learn about these communities but have no strong sustained mechanism to return the insights back to them for their improvement. We're working to address this. And three, a program we're calling Weather Insights. This is a new program where we're working with broadcast meteorologists to create microblogs about social science research findings and their implications for broadcast practice, making social science research more approachable, digestible, and meaningful. Between these organizational innovations and others, the Behavioral Insights Unit will work to foster deeper connections between social science research and operations. We're really just getting started in all of this, so please follow us and offer any ideas you have for innovative ways to implement this bridging within a research environment like SIMS and SSL. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I'm, I'm learning so much. I don't know about you guys. I hope you are too. Um, we will now take a few minutes to address some of the questions submitted by you, our audience. Uh, do you have a question? Type it in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Bethany? Thanks, Kelly. Uh, the first question for Cody and Holly, has any work been done examining the public's understanding of probabilistic hazard information? I would yeah. actually call that question over to Kim because she <laughs> yeah. has done work on the public's understanding of probabilistic hazard information. 
Yeah, um, my dissertation was actually on fee exactly, the, the technology you saw um, Cody and Holly displaying, and much I followed very much in the, the tradition of Susan Joslin's research. It was a, an experimental psychology approach, um, decision, decision science approach, decision experiment. And what I found was that, yes, the public, much like Susan has found in so many of her other studies, the public really can use uh, this information and um, they, they would withhold uh, protective actions at lower probabilities and they would take more protective action at higher probabilities. And importantly, I also found this carried implications for you know, the outcomes. I put them through decision trials. So when there really was a tornado, um, it was really important important for them to have taken a protective action. I found people experienced fewer false alarms and fewer missed protections where they should have protected and they trusted the information overall much more than people who had deterministic information alone. Well, thanks, Kim, and thanks for the tag team approach there, ladies. Um, the next question for Justin, where is social science research headed regarding tornado risks? Um, there you go. Sorry, I just had to try and unmute myself there. So apologies for that. Um, I, I think there are several uh, main areas, certainly within the Vortex Southeast, which is the project that I'm involved in. Um, we, we, we're looking at maybe three or four very principal questions. Um, uh, what is the ideal time to force action when a tornado is warned? So at that time between people actually getting the warning and, and acting on it, um, some people mill and actually need that to actually force themselves into action. So that's something that's quite tricky. Um, the sheltering options for the wider publics. Um, what are the actual vulnerabilities versus the perceptions of vulnerabilities? And as I mentioned in my talk, why don't we count survivors? Um, because I think these are all questions that are big social science questions that need to be uh, answered uh, across the Vortex Southeast. And uh, as Kim mentioned, um, you know, uh, this idea that it's not extracted um, so that you know we give back to the communities and the communities take an interest in what we're doing with them to in help us to inform how we can them better. I hope that right. helps. Absolutely. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Cody and Holly, um, this one I know you guys can answer. Um, the person would like to know how you select your broadcast participants. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so we um, typically do a recruitment period um, that happens a couple months before the experiment. Um, and we distribute that um, recruitment material like a number of different ways. Um, we often send them through the weather service regions and also those often go out to different um, integrated warning team lists that different WFOs have. But we also recruit through um, the AMS and also through um, NWA. I'd also like to point out that, you know, as we receive applications, which includes includes like a one page CV, we also thoroughly research our applicants on YouTube to um, look at their weather coverage. Great. Thanks, ladies. Uh, and we've got time for one more question. So speaking of applicants, um, Kim, there is a question for you. Uh, does your team have any upcoming job opportunities? Sure. So one of the things that we're working to develop right now are um, positions for an, a research to operations social scientist and an operations to research social scientist, um, in addition to possibly uh, some other opportunities. Uh, just like with the Vortex program, I opportunistically reached out to them. They were at the lab and and convinced them we need this person to help us with this stuff. Um, we're, we're always looking to grow and innovate some of these jobs. So do look out for those opportunities to hit the street. They should be soon if you're interested. And um, of course, look for any other future opportunities. Even amid this time of COVID, we're looking to grow. Great. Thanks, Kim. And thanks to the audience for the questions. They keep coming in. Um, some of these will hold to the, the end of uh, the session. But Kelly, I'm going to send it back to you now. All right. Thank you, Bethany. And uh, thanks everyone for the great questions. We'll now begin our final section, starting with Steven Strader. He is an assistant professor at Villanova University. 
and has studied the impacts of tornadoes due to population growth, in the, especially in the southeastern United States. His research is part of the Vortex Southeast Research Project. Stephen? Yeah, so I think largely my work can be split into these two separate um, camps. Um, over the last 10 years or so, I've focused on how the intersection of these two ideas have really um, taken a hold. Uh, uh, the first set of, of research that I'm involved with is, is this idea called the expanding bullseye effect. The expanding bullseye effect is arguing that as cities grow and expand, as, as population grows in cities, the built environment, the, the built footprint of these cities expands, we're seeing greater impacts from hazards, not just tornadoes, but hail, wind, um, all these different variety of, of, of natural hazards. Um, a good example of that is with the Cookville tornado that happened um, just this past month, where we see that city that, that largely was a rural development in the 1940s and 50s. And as the, the development expanded, the tornado that occurred there that would have hit uh, open fields 40, 50 years ago is now hitting suburban and exurban subdivisions. Um, so switching gears a little bit, um, we can take a look at the Southeast um, US tornado mobile home problem. That's where I really spent the last four or five years of, of my career, which is sort of understanding that, you know, when we think of tornadoes, we think of them occurring in the central plains and, and what we call tornado alley. That's where a majority of tornadoes occur, but where if we look to see where tornado fatalities are occurring, they're really happening in the southeast. Um, they're not occurring as, as frequently in the central plains. And a big portion of that or reason for that is mobile manufactured housing density and how many mobile manufactured homes we have, not just in mobile home parks, but scattered throughout the rural landscape. So if we actually look at the impact potential down in the bottom left of the slide, if you compare all homes between Kansas and Oklahoma, and you say, what are the odds that a tornado hits a mobile home? And what are the odds that a tornado hits any home? Um, it makes sense that because Alabama is more populated compared to Kansas, that your odds of a uh, house being impacted in Alabama is much greater than in, the, uh, in, than in Kansas. But if you look at mobile homes uh, in terms of their impact potential, it's 350% greater um, to be affected by a tornado compared to Kansas. A good example of that is looking at uh, the Beauregard um, Smith Station, Alabama tornado from uh, 2019, which uh, if you compare that against Joplin, the, the, you know, the tornado that we consider the sort of the worst of the worst um, modern day tornadoes, um, all things being equal, looking at the number of homes exposed versus the number of fatalities, um, all structures in this case, uh, you see that the Beauregard Smith Station tornado is three times greater in terms of a fatality rate compared to the Joplin event. If you look at just those fatalities that occurred in homes, it's seven times greater in the Beauregard event. So we have to be careful when we're looking at the intersection of tornadoes and housing types. And then lastly, the takeaway here is that the structural anchoring is critical. Um, how homes are secured against the ground and kept to the ground has been vastly important and that's where we're headed with future research. Thank you, Stephen. It's um, sobering information. Our last presenter will discuss her research related to better flood information for the public. Rachel Hogan Carr is with the Nurture Nature Center in Pennsylvania. She has worked with the National Weather Service's Eastern Region to improve flood risk communication. Rachel? Hi. Over the past 10 years, working with East Carolina University, Nurture Nature Center has conducted a series of social science studies about how various audiences use and understand National Weather Service hydrologic forecast products, and particularly flood warning products. Our focus groups have included residents and professionals in urban and rural communities across the country, riverine and coastal alike. Using scenario-based discussions, participants have given us feedback on how they use, interpret, understand, and make decisions based on a wide range of forecast tools, from hydrographs and probabilistic forecasts to watches, warnings, emergency briefings. And you see a couple of those here. We traveled to flood-prone communities, showed them products showing a serious scenario building in their community, gathered feedback on how they interpreted these products, then we went home, revised the products based on what we learned, and came back and retested with new audiences in these same communities. And across the hundreds of participants in all these communities, certain themes emerge as consistent. Primarily that design matters. Hydrologic and meteorologic data 
is, of course, the backbone of these products, but users make really quick decisions about whether a product applies and whether they're going to invest more time and take action. And some of the findings we found make intuitive sense. For instance, that people interpret red as a warning color. But what's surprising is the extent to which these design cues make decisions for people. So in the absence of red, we've heard that people have interpreted that as a lack of danger. I would have wanted you to put that in red, they said, if, if, you were, if that was really going to be risky. And so if their geographic place is mentioned, then they assume it applies to them. But if the city name is not listed in a flood watcher warning, does that then mean it is not applied to them? Um, and so titles are also very critical. The inset on the left is a product called Significant Flood Outlook. And when we showed this to audiences, the word significant meant different things to different people. They could not find themselves on that original map. They couldn't interpret the various shading. The revised version, the larger version, is called simply the Five Day River Flood Outlook. And this is what we tested. And it was much better received and understood with design tweaks. We didn't require a new computing technology, but rather rethought how the information was presented. Similarly, labels, legends, place names are so critical. People need to quickly identify where they are and connect that location to these other design cues. Am I in the red zone? Am I in the blue zone, et cetera? On the right, probabilistic forecasts. They're increasingly common and have been a focus of our research across the country for the past several years. They're really helpful for letting users grasp the most likely and perhaps worst case scenarios. But without careful interpretation of products, our findings are that the data can overwhelm and sometimes lead people to make false conclusions and lose trust in the data in the forecast, especially when the probabilistic information diverges from the deterministic or official forecast. So balancing that data with text-based explanations, such as the forecaster's note you see circled, clear legends, or packaging it with uh, briefing inf information is essential for supporting the decisions that both professionals and residents need to make. Which is the last point, uh, which is that not all users have the same needs, and one-size-fits-all products are not likely to be optimal, but we recognize that they may be required. So transitioning findings like these into the product design from the get-go and work as we've worked with our partners to do can really improve outcomes for all users. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Very useful information. All right, it's time for questions about these two interesting topics. What questions do you have for these presenters? Bethany? Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Stephen, there are quite a few questions kind of coming in all along the same line. So uh, kind of let me start with, if you do you know if structural engineers are working more closely with mobile home manufacturers to build more substantial structures since home choice is based heavily on affordability, um, mobile home use is, is unlikely to decrease? Yeah, that's that's a good question and a tough one because um, largely we, we were trying to reach these individuals. There's a big disconnect in terms of the community um, from emergency managers and, and severe weather scientists and structural engineers when we're trying to cross over the bridge to get to the mobile and manufactured housing industry. So we're working on bridging those gaps, but it's not an easy thing to do because there's a lot of politics at play. There's a lot of, of money at play. Um, and there's a cultural aspect to it. So um, that's really sort of an uphill battle that we'll be involved with over the next you know, decade or so. But the idea here is to work with them and trying to identify cheaper options so that we can not only improve the future safety of manufactured homes, but going back and retrofitting those existing structures. Thanks, and then kind of related to that, do you know of any states that actually require mobile homes to be anchored? Yeah, so that's another great question. Um, FEMA, you know, after Hurricane Andrew in 1992, that, that changed the game in terms of mobile manufactured home anchorage. Um, basically, the U.S. along the coastline was split into three wind zones that says that your positive anchoring, the anchoring to keep the mobile home secured to the ground, uh, has to meet certain wind load requirements. And those along the coast and pretty much all of Florida are required to have anchoring. The problem is, is um, only two counties in what I would consider the heart of, of the Southeast tornado area, uh, which are just Baldwin and Mobile County in Alabama are required to have anchoring. So uh, when you get to the inner parts of Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, those, those hearts of where people are dying, mobile homes are really only held down by the weight of their own structure. There's nothing anchoring them to the ground and their requirements by law 
are just saying that they're heavy enough to meet the minimum requirements of sitting there on the ground. So we're working to get that changed, but that's going to take sort of an army of people and, and a big momentum shift in terms of the industry. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a tall order. Uh, so switching over to Rachel, there's a question that came in. Um, what are some of the challenges you found with presenting probabilistic forecast to diverse audiences? The level of information that's needed by professional people and residential, or for lack of a better word, people who don't use these products in their um, professional work is really different. And the skill in interpreting um, statistical information, of course, varies as well. So some of the specific um, details, we tested so many different versions of probabilistic uh, forecasts for uh, river levels in um, Colorado and California and New York, uh, but there are things like the 5 to 95 percent chance and these other concepts that um, statistically make sense, but they're not at all intuitive for users. And so we kind of found ourselves in, in conundrums sometimes where if that information was, that statistical detailed information was not included, then the professional users felt like they were less able to make the decision. If it was included, it confused <laughs> the residential users who didn't understand how there could be a 5 to 95% chance of something. So they were misinterpreting how these lines worked. Um, so we worked really carefully to try to create um, di different approaches to using the legend and testing um, how to characterize and, and, and showcase that um, in order to meet both needs. Some communities, for instance, um, have um, used stage and some use flow. And when you start, um, and whether or not to put both of those pieces of information onto an already busy product can make it even busier. And we've found that the more information you try to pack into one product can make a less experienced user decide that they it, it is either too much for them or they start to misread the information and come to very confident wrong conclusions sometimes <laughs> about what it means. Um, and, and so it was that was the the large challenge is getting the balance right between enough information for the professional users to make their detailed decisions about when and where to take in equipment out of a, a river, for instance, um, and also getting the idea that there's a real risk coming and likely or less likely to the public at the same time. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we've got quite a few questions from some of the, the beginning sessions too. So uh, let me go back. Um, and Susan, there's a question um, that you mentioned uh, probability of decision didn't matter based on education level, um, but the person would like to know if you factored in experience, uh, for example, the years in a profession. Um, so the analysis that I was talking about is one in which we dichotomized um, uh, participants into people who had a high school education or less and a college education or more. Um, and so we didn't do an analysis in which we asked, was there an improvement based on uh, education level? In other words, was it correlated with education level? So the analysis told us that there, there was no significant difference between these two groups in the sense that those with a high school education or less um, experienced the same advantage in having probabilistic as opposed to deterministic information, as did those with a college education or more. All right, thanks, Susan. Uh, next question is for Jeanette. Is there an ideal time of day to post tweets in order to reach more people? That's a really good question. Um, I wish I had a very solid answer for you. I will tell you that um, people do tend to pay more attention to tweets in the hours when they are not working. And so in the evenings, that would be an ideal time. And also on the weekends, and surprisingly, when we're currently looking at coronavirus tweets from public health departments, and we're seeing a significant drop off on the weekends, which is exactly when you would find people having more time on their hands to look at messages. Um, and so it's thinking about those, uh, the golden hours when people are home and have the flexible time to scroll through um, is when you would want to actually engage with people. I wanted to mention um, something earlier that I had completely forgotten is that another way to grow your audience is during those 
threat periods is when you make your when you insert your messages into the Twitter stream and give people consistent information over and over again, you show value, and that's when accounts do tend to grow and they don't lose followers after that. And so that's an excellent time to grow your follower numbers is by providing relevant information during a th period of threat um, so that you can increase your account at that time. Awesome. Thanks, Jeanette. Uh, Justin, the next question is for you. Um, and the person would like to know how would or should we measure tornado survivability long-term and systematically? Um, it's, um, it's not an easy question. I think that's why we've, we've put it out there. But I, I think uh, we need to put people in the field at the same time that uh, people are going in the field to, unfortunately, uh, try and find out what caused deaths. I, I think we need to interview people about what made people survive as well. So it is possible. Um, the best practice I've seen with the epidemiology it, with this worked with uh, social workers and nurses who were responding to the event at that time. And people were very, very willing to talk to them and they got excellent epidemiological information. But at the same time, we might be able to get excellent uh, survivability information as well. Um, like I said, there are certain things that are with, uh, outside of people's control, but there are a lot of things that I think we can learn from how and why people survive in that way. Great, thank you. Uh, Stephen, a question for you. What sort of actions can weather service offices take to help mitigate mobile home related injuries and fatalities? Well, one thing that we're actively trying to do is, especially in the Southeast, is um, if anybody at the weather service, any office reaches out to me, we can provide them with um, a newly created mobile home data set. Um, right now, it's just available for uh, Alabama, but we're working on and hopefully receiving support to develop a nationwide mobile home location data set where we can tell you exactly where um, all of your mobile homes in your WFO or CWA or our, uh, your WFO region or your CWA are located. Um, I think the, the beauty in that is is you, or you're able to reach out to those individuals um, across your entire county warning area prior to any event occurring and, and provide some education opportunities or afterwards it could help emergency respond responders uh, reach those most vulnerable communities. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do is um, target individuals that are mobile manufactured um, home residents and, and go in and actually figure out what they know and what what we can do to reach out to them. And one of the key areas that we believe is, is reaching out to um, churches and those seem to be really strong communal ties. So there's a lot of sort of um, cooks in the kitchen right now and, and pans in the fryer and we're trying to um, solve this systematically. But right now, we, we, I don't think there's one magic bullet solution. There's gonna be a variety of solutions that will add up to something larger. Um, but anybody's always able to reach out to me um, and I would be gladly, um, hope, hopefully I can share my information and any data that I have with them. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and we've got time for one very, very brief question. And uh, Kim, this is directed towards towards you. Um, will you have any NRAPs to help with your projects? Oh, great question. Um, remind me, NRAP. Um, oh, is I'm this sorry, the, the, the NOAA Rotational Assignment Program. Right, so it's existing um, people within within NOAA who would like to rot take a rotation in. Yes. Um, you know, I would need to talk with um, my my um, chain um, higher up above me about that, what it would take to bring those people in. But I think that sounds like a wonderful idea to explore. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I'll be happy to connect you with that person uh, later if you would like. So, sure, thank you. Um, yeah, no problem. And that's it for questions and, and time. So Kelly, back to you. All right, thank you, Bethany. Um, I Castle um, wasn't able to add that he, he has more presentations on his topic and uh, you can find those on castlewilliams.com. Um, that wraps today's three minute thesis webinar on the value of social science and weather forecasting. I want to thank all of our panelists today. Uh, I hope you, our audience, have enjoyed these excellent presentations as much as I have.
At the end of this session, a few brief questions will appear on your screen. Please take one more minute to respond to these. We really rely on your feedback. It's crucial to help us plan future webinars like this one. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Bethany Perry for her critical technical support and, as always, her ability to juggle many things at once. As a reminder, this webinar was organized by the NOAA Central Region Collaboration Team. And if you'd like to learn more about us, check out our webpage at www.regions.noaa.gov central. On that site, uh, by Monday, you will also find the recording for today's webinar. If you have any questions, please contact me. Uh, email is keli.pirtle at noaa.gov or bethany, B-E-T-H-A-N-Y dot P-E-R-R-Y at noaa.gov. Thanks again, everyone, for your participation. Have a great day and stay well.